Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. When you're a 10-time Emmy award-winning show, you really did beat out all the competition. And when it comes to The Amazing Race and its host, Phil Kogan, that's just what they did. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Phil has hosted The Amazing Race since its beginning. And now as host of National Geographic's Explorer, you can say he truly gets around. But with his podcast bucket, he's also on a mission to get everyone to live life to their fullest. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. Phil, it is a pleasure. Uh, I've been a fan of all of your shows, from The Amazing Race to the National Geographic Explorer, and now your podcast bucket. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Well, thank you, and thanks for the great cookies that you had in the lobby. Oh, it's my, I, I, now, now you're going to really get more stars on the well, show, right? I, I'd, like to, I'd like a little sugar rush in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had my coffee. Ah, uh, you're, and, you're uh, imitating uh, me it, now, huh? No, <laughs> I love your accent. I love accents. That's my, my thing. I love accents. I'm oh. from New Zealand originally, and I think in my life I've had about four primary accents, so I'm always listening, and I picked up yours straight away. You would say bagel with a schmear. Is that right? <laughs> that and a cup of coffee? Correct. And a cup of coffee. Anyway, thank you for the cookies. It's my pleasure, and thank you for coming on the show. And it's funny you said accent, because originally, from what I read, you, they didn't even want to hire you. you were, actually, you went out for the survivor yes. at the first, and then they didn't really want to hire you because you had an accent. And finally, Les Moonves said, we're going to give it a shot. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because... Um, when I first came to America in 1992, I had a stronger New Zealand accent, and, and, and it was a big issue. And so I was doing some auditioning for some acting work, and they, I had to almost audition twice, because I had to audition for this sort of small talk before you did the reading of the lines in an American accent, so they didn't know that I was from New Zealand, so that they weren't listening for the New Zealand accent when I read in an American accent. So I would do the small chat in an American accent and then try to roll from that into reading the lines. And the world was just so different then. And as you said, when I was up for Survivor and, and it was between Jeff Probst and I for that job, it was a big issue that I had this uh, a, a New Zealand accent. And now you've got Simon Lithgow, you've got Simon, uh, uh, sorry, Nigel Lithgow, Simon Cow. Uh, Cat Dealey, so you think it can dance? You've got all these different accents. <laughs> Heidi Klum. It wasn't a. It, it's not an issue now, but it was, you know, 20 years ago. Well, I'll tell you. I got my first job. I was mentioning to you my first job was as an anchor man at Anchorage, in Anchorage Alaska. Anchorage, Alaska. Yeah. And I got the job because of my New York accent. Did you see the way you just said because? No, did you? I noticed it straight away. <laughs> well, I don't because. have an accent anymore. Yeah, so, you do. But, you don't think you have an accent. You have an accent. And it's but, part of your charm. But uh, thank you, thank you. But that's how I got the job. They thought that having someone from uh, New York in Anchorage would sort of boost. Give it some prestige. Give it some prestige. It's, it's a little bit like people who have English accents. They immediately assume that they must be hyper intelligent. Oh, oh yes, he's very, very smart. You know. <laughs> right? It's and meanwhile, true. the guy could have an IQ of 86. Oh, right? it, but he matter. has that accent. Yeah. Oh, he must be super smart. Well, they thought I was sophisticated too, so I fooled them. But uh, I, I love this line, though, from you because and everyone comes up to you, and I can tell, you know, how do you win the amazing race? And how do you. But this is your line You've got nothing but a sense of humor. Yeah. You will survive. I thought, wow, what? And that's kind of the truth of almost. Forget the amazing race, right. but life in itself. Yes. If you're able to laugh yes. when others are struggling, you will 
survive. Yeah, I believe that a sense of humor is the key to survival. We live in a really challenging time, and I think if you think about the, the times when you're, when you're faced the biggest adversities in your life and, and you're surrounded by people who have this sense of humor, they're the ones that get you through. I really do believe it's, it's the key to survival, that you have to learn how to laugh in the face of adversity to survive. And remember that wonderful film, what was it called, My Beautiful Life, where the, where the oh, father yes. pretended to the son that even though they were being held captive by the Germans uh, during, in a concentration camp, that it was just one big game. You know, he had this, he had the, abil the ability to, to shift reality for his son. And so I feel like a sense of humor is the same way of, of, uh, of combating, uh, you know, rather than labeling the problem, just finding a different way of thinking about the problem. So life is a challenge, and if you can find a way to laugh at it, uh, I do believe it, it helps you keep the, uh, uh, the right frame of mind to be able to take on dealing with the problem. Let me ask you two specific things, because you were an admirer of, uh, oh gosh, you're going to have Henry Watt, Harry Watson? Yeah. And Harry you Watson. did a documentary on him, and he was the first New Zealander to win the Tour de France. Well, he, he was the first New Zealander to ride in the Tour de France. He was part of the first English-speaking team. Oh, that's what it is. Yes, okay. and I found his book, and so here is this. I, I love stories about underdogs, and, and that's why I gravitated to that story, because he was an underdog. He was part of this team that went halfway around the world to race against the best racers in the world. Well, and another one is, uh, I'm gonna, oh, Shackleton, and yes. his story in Antarctic. Now, do you think in that case, because that story, if people aren't familiar with it, yes. you, you can help us go along and familiarize them, but it was this man and his crew was trapped in Antarctica, yes. and it reminds me almost of The Martian, by, um, yeah, with, uh, by Sir Ridley Scott with yes, um, Matt, Damon. Matt Damon, because there was really no, no way to survive unless you really put all of, and it's very funny, in The Martian, when it was the Golden Globes, they actually had it up for comedy, and yes. there was no comedy in it. But I'm thinking now, well, when we talk about humor, yeah. in a sense, did Shackleton have it when he Absolutely. had to rescue the crew? Absolutely, and the crew, they would do fun things, they would put on plays, they would, they would, they would tell stories, they would sing songs, you know, how you measure comedy, I mean, what, what you find funny, what I find funny is different, but I guess what I'm saying is just the ability to, to, to laugh in the face of adversity, whether that's through a funny little song or a funny little look or whatever that is, to keep people's spirits up. Because there's, to me, there's two types of people who, when they're faced with a, a, a problem, there are those people who immediately go into problem-solving mode, they go into, all right, we have a flat tire, what do we do to fix it? And then there are the other people that go, we have a flat tire, we're going to be late for the meeting. Oh my God, I've got to take everything out of the back of the car. Maybe the tire's going to be flat. When was the last time it was fit? You know, there are people that go to labeling what is wrong in a, prob in a situation. And then there are those that immediately focus on, we have a challenge, how do we deal with it? What's right in this situation as opposed to what's wrong? So it, it, they are the people that I like to surround myself with, and I have been very lucky to be around people who immediately go, like my cameraman friend, Scott Shelley, I've been working, my wife and I have been working with him for almost 30 years. I've been to over 100 countries with him. This guy, he's the first one to go to, we've got a problem, how do we fix it? And, and, and then a bit of a giggle and a laugh along the way. Like, you know, he'll realize that he doesn't have something. So rather than labeling that we don't have it, he'll just say, oh, man, I wish I could, you know, make a call. You know? Well, you know, <laughs> and we're I, somewhere where we can't make a call. It's obvious. <laughs> I had on the great late actor Carl Malden. Yes. And the book that he wrote was, When Do, we, when do I Start? Okay. That was it. He wanted to know, you just tell me what it is. When do I start? Do Those I start? are the kind of guys we're, and gals we're talking and about. And their, their personalities are infectious like, th when you're around people like that, they make you feel like you can do anything because they have this spirit about them, they have this energy about them that anything in the world is possible. And so I have been extremely lucky in my life that I have been surrounded by, by optimists, people who focus on what they, 
do have and what they can do, as opposed to people who focus on what they don't have and what they can't do. So I find the, the, uh, the, the latter to be quite poisonous. So, you know, sometimes you'll have these poisonous type people enter into your life and you have to kind of, uh, to quote my friend Albert Lin, you have to kind of uh, do a judo move to get around it all because uh, sometimes they're like a wall of no and you either have to, uh, you know, push them out of the way or go around them or go up and over them because the wool reference seems to be very uh, good right now, don't you think? You love Why that? not? Yeah, it's very, it's very topical right yeah. now. <laughs> well, you know, Can a wool stop anybody? <laughs> not everybody. Well, you know, and in fact, whenever I hire a person, yes. I don't care what their credits are, I don't care how great of an artist they may be, yeah. I need that attitude yes. that yes, I can yes. more than anything else. Yeah, because th that's why Shackleton's men, going back to Shackleton, so for people who don't know the Shackleton story, Perhaps the greatest survival adventure story in the history, well, certainly in, in recorded history, where he set out to go down to the Antarctic, to go across the Antarctic, and uh, they, the ship got stuck in the ice. And the, the seasons changed, and it got colder and colder, and eventually the ship, with all these men, the ship got crushed in the ice, and they found themselves taking all the supplies off the boat, off the ship, and, and put every, everything into little lifeboats and then having to drag the lifeboats mile after mile after mile north to try to get to the ocean in the roughest stretch of water, perhaps the roughest stretch of water in the world, and then trying to navigate with the stars to try to find land, which they eventually did, but his whole journey completely took a 180. Like he, he went, his, his adventure was only really started once he turned around. Yeah, to go fact, back the opposite way. And it's now the adventure, in fact, it, it's almost like a quest. You don't yes. even know where the journey is going to end because his adventure now is, I've got to save my, my men. men. And he did. And, and he did. And for those people who have not read that story, I think um, Liam Neeson played uh, Shackleton in a, in, in a, a film uh, version of it. But the book itself, uh, I believe it's Caroline Alexander who did, a, who did uh, the book. And... Uh, there was a photographer on board who was shooting in those days all glass plates with the silver nitrate on glass plates and the photographs that and they had to carry these glass plates and this poor photographer had to work out which ones he was going to keep because Shackleton said we can't take all your photographs you've got to you know do some serious editing and work out which ones you're going to keep and not and they dragged those those beautiful uh, photographs on these ships and, and eventually they got, if you have a chance to look at them, black and white, oh my goodness, beautiful. Well, that now takes us directly to Bucket because your podcast, and, and please give out the way that our viewers can, can watch. This is what's so beautiful about it. It is taped and it is something that you can just listen to. Yeah. Tell us where, uh, because I want to get really into it, where can my viewers or anybody who's catching this right now catch your podcast called Bucket? So Bucket is produced uh, by my wife and, and producing partner. We had this idea that we wanted to share these inspirational stories. So the podcast platform is just such a wonderful way to meet people, <laughs> spend time with people, uh, without having to necessarily sit down and look at people, like just to listen to people. It's such a wonderful, uh, to me, it's just a wonderful new way of, of gathering great stories or, or listening to really good stories. So Bucket with Phil Kogan, which is what we're calling it, Bucket with an IT um, as opposed to an ET, uh, is Bucket with Phil Kogan is available wherever you can, wherever you get your podcast. And then the video version I guess the best way to, to look at it, uh, beautifully shot by our award-winning cameraman, Scott Shelley, uh, you just go to my website, which is philcogan.com, and all of them are listed there, and they're, you know, if you want to sit down and you want to watch the interview, you can. Well, I, I, I have to tell you, I have watched them, and, and I want to sh sh talk about some of them because they, they are, you, you're, and by the way, wait a minute, I've got to give myself a plug. I'm invited on, from what I understand. I, my, I, well, well, my wife invited you on. She did. I said you did what? 
<laughs> she said, I did. Phil, come on. I said, oh, okay. So no, I am I'm invited on, and I am too. And, and viewers, I will let you know when and where, and you could reach me at barrykibrick.com, or I'll give you my email later even as well. So no, we'll I'm, let them know. I'm looking forward to that. The tables will be reversed. Somewhere. I love yeah. it. I can't wait. But one of the things that, uh, that, that, st that struck me was when I first read how much you love a good story, yeah. and then I saw your conversation with Susan Zerinsky, Zerinsky yeah. and I said, well, you can't get much of a better story right. than she's a great storyteller. So yeah. that you, you, you have this knack of taking what you want and your, your mission is to be inspiring yes. and then finding the different people that you believe will help with your mission to inspire those who are listening or watching the podcast. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way that we've been finding people, Louise will say, oh, I just read this article about this person and look what they're doing, or the same thing, people that I've met in my life or that I think would be a great story. And Susan Zerinsky, um, for those who don't know, has now become the new head of CBS News. It's the first time a woman has ever held this position. She started as an intern at CBS News uh, back in the Watergate days. So she's a woman who has incredible history, and she's been to Iraq, and she's covered everything. She's been to Panama and covered all the, all the big news stories for the last, gosh, how many years ago is that? 40 years. And I met her, and immediately just we just connected. I gravitated to her wonderful stories, and we, we talked. We met at this party, and then when... Uh, when we released our film about the 1928 Tour de France, she came and she wrote a, a wonderful uh, email back about how much she had enjoyed the film. And we just oh, stayed... Tell what it is. It's called The Ride. Yeah, so the film's called The Ride. It's retracing the 1928 Tour de France where I rode a 1928 Tour de France bicycle with no gears that weighs twice as much as a modern bike along the original course, an average of 150 miles a day, completely circumnavigating France. And we made it into a film. It's called La Ride. It's available on Hulu and, and it was in a bunch of festivals, including South by Southwest. So she came to one of the screenings that we had and said she loved the film. So we struck up a sort of a, a friendship and I visited her in New York and her office is like a, it's like a shrine. It's like a, it's, it's little, little bits and pieces of her life all over her office, the shoes that she wore when she ran down to, to, to cover what was going on uh, in, during the um, September 11th, uh, which was just a few blocks from her office. And she, can't, she has the shoes hanging there as a reminder of what happened that day. They've still got the dust all over them. Um, and then this letter from, uh, sorry, a script from Walter Cronkite that she pulled out and showed me and Everywhere around the, I would drive my wife crazy because she hates me collecting anything. And she, if she saw Susan's office, she might take it easy on me. But um, yeah, it's just a clutter of, of, her, of her life. Anyway, uh, when we were doing this podcast, I said to, to Lou, I said, we really need to get Susan in and have a chat. And, right. and it, was, it was so captivating. We ended up making it into two <laughs> episodes because she had so many stories. I also really enjoyed your chat with your dad. And yeah. he was uh, obviously your primary and first inspiration. And, and, and my mom, yeah. And your mom. Yeah. And, uh, and again, what, what you can see he imbued in your spirit is be open. Yeah. Be open-minded to whatever may come your way because you never know what incident might be the one yeah. that changes your life. My, my parents, uh, I really w would say, are the greatest life teachers I've ever had. Um, my mom, if she didn't marry my dad, would have been a really good nun. You know, <laughs> yeah, she's so... <laughs> Go into that one a little well, bit more. <laughs> me meaning she's just so giving and, and, and selfless and, 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 and uh, she just, she, she loves helping people and she has, the home, our home is always open to people um, sometimes to the point, you know, when I was a kid, it was, it, it would drive me insane. Um, just because people would be coming in and out of the house. She just opened up the house. I remember she opened up the house to some sailors. We were driving down the road and, and I, I grew up in Antigua, in a small island of Antigua in the Caribbean. And, uh, my mom was 
we were driving into town. She, my mom had uh, was a music teacher and she was teaching a class and she saw these sailors on the side of the road. And my mom said, oh, we should pick these guys up and take them into town. And I said, mom, <laughs> what do you don't? Like my sister and I, we, we were embarrassed by the idea that my mom was gonna pick up these sailors, three <laughs> sailors. So anyway, my mom goes in and teaches a class for an hour and we're driving back home and the three sailors are still standing on the side of the road with these big bags. And my mom says, I'm stopping. And I go, mom. Oh. So she stops, rolls down the windows and said, what are you guys doing? And, and they said, oh, we're waiting for the bus. We've got to go into town. We've got to do our laundry. And my mom said, oh, there's no bus. And they go, oh, yeah, but there's a, stop, there's a bus stop thing right there. Oh, she said, no, no, that it hasn't been working since the 60s. You guys need to come home. So next thing, we're all crammed into our Ford Escort driving home with these three sailors and the, and the trunk open with the big duffel bags of dirty la uh, laundry in the back. And we go home, and my mom says, I've got to teach a class, because she was teaching a piano. Uh, you guys, there's the machine, there's the powder, you guys go for it. So it was in the garage, and, and so these guys completely take over the garage. Anyway, in between teaching, my mom comes out and says, Will you guys love, would you guys like to stay for dinner? And they said, oh, ma'am, that would be lovely. So my mom is teaching, running from the music room back to the kitchen, trying to cook dinner, running back to the music room. And one of the sailors comes up and says, let me do that. And she goes, no, 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 you are our guest. You mustn't, you mustn't do that. And one of the other sailors says, ma'am, he's the, he's the cook on the, on the ship. You should, let him, you should let him cook. So my dad comes home and sees these three men with the laundry scattered everywhere and a guy throwing a pizza up in the air, <laughs> <laughs> cooking, oh. cooking dinner for us. We had the most amazing meal. And, uh, and then late, late that night, they took us back to their, it was a nuclear uh, submarine and they, and they took us back to the submarine and they, uh, uh, and gave us a tour at about 1130 at night. Oh. Cut to uh, about a year later, we stayed in contact with them. They'd come and see us every time they came into port. Cut to about a year later, my brother was born. There weren't diapers readily available on the, on the island. So these three guys come down the, come out of the submarine with boxes of diapers for, for, my, for my mom. Well, from, see, well, for know, my brother, I'm sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. But you, there, again, what, proof of point. Yeah. You never know when you make that turn, when you make that decision, yeah. what's going to happen. And this yeah. is what you constantly are exploring and it is what makes it so dynamic to watch, to listen, to see what you do because that is the, when we talk about being open, that is the key to discovery. Yeah. That's truly exploration of the soul and the mind. I know you specialize in exploration as well as of the volcanoes that you've d dove into in National Geographic and things like that. But on your podcast, you get to explore the souls and the minds of those who do it. Yeah, my, my father-in-law says, luck is the residue of design. And, 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 and the reason I love that quote is because it's only by throwing the line out that you have an opportunity to catch something. So I'm always trying to, 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 to say to people, there really isn't such a thing as failure if you're trying to do something. It, 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 it really is a necessary step to being able to achieve something. So you cannot achieve unless you're prepared to try. And if you try, you will fail. It's, it, at some point, you're going to fail. It's just an inherent part of the journey, just as Shackleton tried to go to Antarctica, but he technically, you could say he failed, but then he actually achieved something completely different. So was that a failure or was that an, a success that he saved all his men? Well, I would say it was a huge success because they could have all died out there. So yeah, it's just that those are the people, again, those are the people that I like less of this analysis paralysis and more of this I'll give it a go. And that's very much part of the Kiwi uh, psyche is, oh yeah, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a shot. Well, you know, uh, my next thing I wanted to bring up was your, your words, obstacles into opportunities. That's just what we're talking about. But Phil, our time is up. I'm gonna save that for our afterwards segment yes. so our viewers can see it online, but man, has it been a pleasure, sir? Thank what a you. joy having you on the show. Yeah, thank you. 
And uh, folks, thank you for joining us. Remember, following this episode, you can catch our afterwards feature at barrykibrick.com. And then Phil and I will discuss how you not only can turn obstacles into opportunities, but how you absorb that philosophy so it becomes part of your character. And while you're there, see all the ways you can get involved directly with me and the show. Plus, like Phil, now all of our episodes are available on podcast. Drop me a line at barry at barrykibrick.com. I'll personally respond and give you the details and even let you know when I'm on Phil's podcast. Now, before we go, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Phil Kogan. We have a gift of life. What we do with that gift is dependent on the choices we make, the people who we spend time with, the things that we go out to do every day. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between all the choices we make, some for the better, some for the worse, the most important choice is always to choose the gift of life. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. My pleasure, To sir. become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon, Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. <laughs>